So um, for the ladies in the room, you've probably experienced this kind of image before, right? Waiting, waiting for the toilet. And when you came here today, you probably didn't give much thought about whether there would be a toilet um, at Mercy College that you would be able to use. But, um, but for a lot of people around the world, this isn't the, su the situation. So there are actually more people in the world that have access to iPhones than have access to toilets. Um, you know, we're, we're able to harness this incredible technology in our hands that can send people around the world, can send people to the moon, but we can't figure out how to give everybody access to a toilet, and that's, that's pretty horrific. So actually, over half of the world's population doesn't have access to a, a basic kind of toilet. So um, there are about 46 countries where less than half of the population has access to improved sanitation facilities. And you see it obviously concentrated in certain areas of the world. So particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, in um, Southeast Asia, we see higher incidence of people not having prop, uh, access to proper sanitation. And sanitation kind of has both aspects there. There's the toilet piece, there's also the clean water piece. And we're going to talk about how these are related to each other. And when we're talking about a basic toilet, we're not talking about any sort of fancy kind of uh, access. We're not talking about this very, uh, you know, kind of high-tech, eye-poop toilet that they have here, right? And in different parts of the world, they have kind of made these toilets that are incredibly sophisticated. But we're just talking about a very basic toilet. And the, the concept here is that you are separating human excrement from direct human contact that those two things will at least initially be separated. Um, so this could be flush or poor toilets, it could be latrines to a, a sewer system, it could be a septic tank, it could be a pit latrine, um, that there's some ventilation, it could be a pit latrine with a slab, it could be a composting toilet. So again, it doesn't ha necessarily have to be the toilet that you see across the hallway here at Mercy College, it could look very different from that, but it has to at least have this basic idea that you're separating what you're putting into the toilet from directly touching, um, touching your body. So in a lot of parts of the world, um, we still practice something called open defecation, or what we call poo with no loo. Right? So a little under a billion people around the world still practice open defecation, particularly high levels in India. So about 65% of the population in India um, practices open defecation, which means that they are going out um, into an open environment with no kind of surrounding air um, toilets. So. Under certain circumstances, this doesn't necessarily have a direct impact on sanitation, but if you're doing this in an urban environment, um, it's certainly going to impact your health. If you're doing it in kind of an open environment, if you're going into the woods or going into uh, a jungle area, that's not necessarily going to immediately um, contaminate the, uh, the area unless you're doing it by a water source, but it certainly opens you up to other sorts of situations. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, the goal is to eliminate open defecation in India by next year, so we only have a couple of months. doesn't seem like we're going to be able to tackle that 560 million people who are still practicing this. So the, the, the framework for all of the problems and the possible solutions and calling out the urgency of this issue. And part of the interesting thing about the urgency is that there's an urgent need not just to build toilets and clean sanitation systems, but to change the mindset of people so we understand what toilets really do, what they are, and what is really causing the problem with them. And I know this from first-hand experience, having been a fecophobic American for most of my life, who was astonished when I went to Borneo in 1985, after graduating from Harvard, thinking I understood biological systems, because that's what I studied, biological anthropology, a lot of lab work that I did when I was at Harvard, and a lot of field work. And I get to Borneo, and we're in the remote part of the jungle, and I have a choice for how I can go to the bathroom. I can either use a pit latrine or I can go in the river. And both seem to me completely insane. Where's the flush toilet? Where's the, the, the whatever I can? And the way we say a pit latrine, it meant walking into a place in the jungle where we had two boards laid down over a pit, a shallow pit, and no barrier at all. It was just the jungle. And then the boards were there because the mud would make it impossible if you didn't have something solid to put your feet on. And you squat it. And I remember that first night in the jungle in the rain, squatting, 
over this pit in the jungle, wondering you know, who's watching, orangutans, lizards, and watching with the glow of a kerosene lantern, the ruby red shining lights of the eyes of dung beetles, who immediately sensed, as soon as I started, that there was nutrients to be found, and came flying with this buzzing whirr, <laughs> like little helicopter, through my legs, and then flew out carrying the gifts that I had bestowed upon them. <laughs> and I was fascinated. This ritual became part of what my daily life was like for a year. You'd go out there day or night, you'd do your business, and the dung beetles would be right there, and they would bundle it up and take it away. And after you got over your initial startled uh, feeling of fear, you realize these were your little allies, and they were making sure that those nutrients got evenly distributed so that the jungle could flourish, and that you were a part of that as a contributor. The next thing is moving to another site in the jungle. There were no pit latrines, nor did we have the capability to dig them at the time that we were there, but there was a river. And I thought, ah, I've heard and, and been witness to many stories of contamination where people crap in the water and the people downstream get hurt by it. So I checked with the local Malayu people that we were living with, and they said, oh, that's only the case if they have overwhelmed the abilities of the fish. Here we have not. There's not so many of us here. So come, do your business. And I noticed that when I went to the river to do my business, the fish came and ate it all up. And then we went at night with lanterns and spearfishes, and we speared the fish. And the attitude of the Malayu people was, you're feeding the fish, and that's a good thing. So I thought, well, this is really weird. Now I'm learning from two different sites and two different jungles that the fish and the insects and the other wildlife depend on the nutrients that we bring back to them. And yet I've grown up thinking this is a horrible thing that will cause disease. That troubled me because I went to another place in Sumatra where I got very sick and had to go to the hospital because of fecal contamination of the water, which made me go back to the other jungle site and say, hey, what's going on? And they said, well, they obviously overwhelmed the fish. You can't do this. This then led me to another journey to Sumatra to go to a place where I was at a fish restaurant where they had bird cages all over this pond and the restaurant was perched on stilts over this massive fish pond. And I asked, why all the bird cages? And they said, this is how we feed the fish that feed you, on bird poop. Interesting. So we ordered our meal, and then I said, I have to go to the bathroom. And I went to the human bathroom and decided to look and noticed that where all of the bathroom stuff effluent went was in that same fish pond where they were catching the fish to feed us. So I called the waiter and I said, I'm really worried about this. And he said, oh no, sir, not a problem. We know how many fish we have and we monitor their health, and so we limit the amount of waste that goes in. Now, I don't know if that is being done in a healthful manner or not, but we did not get sick eating those fish. But what a, a mind-bending experience for this year to encounter people who saw our fecal material as an asset rather than a liability, if it was in coherence. And when we came to, um, to Mercy College, this was my chance to see if we could do an effective urban biodigester system. So here is Newsweek magazine from the when I first started at Mercy College. I guess that was, what, five years ago? Six years ago? Six years ago. It was 2012. It was almost seven, seven. Almost seven years ago, right after Hurricane Sandy when you brought me in. And Newsweek had caught hold of what I was doing in Rio de Janeiro. And they had this exploring the end of life as we know it. Are you prepared? And the article's lead was for Newsweek, harnessing the power of human waste to survive. National Geographic Emerging Explorer Paul Hain talks about harnessing the power of poop. Break down your take on trash and poop. And I guess that was in... Um, doesn't say what the date was, does it? 2015, March 2015. Oh, okay, so this was by, okay. This was after we had started doing stuff here. Um, their article focused on what I was doing in the slums, building solar hot water systems out of local material, building biodigesters. They didn't capture the full scope of what we were really doing at Her at Mercy, which was showing that a combination of human waste and food waste was the ideal mixture that we wanted. And we fast forward to today, where 
This is my wife who's from Palestine and worked with the home biogas company from Israel, studied at the Arab Institute of Environmental Studies where composting toilets abound and where biodigesters for home use were at the commercial scale invented. And we've been working with the Araba for the past decade. And this is one of our students, Whitney Fung. Uh, and here you see a wonderful garden that is based on toilet waste. And what we built with our students was a way to capture the nutrients and the energy because all of the toilet waste coming out of this brown pipe here and shower waste with all the soaps and the shampoos and uh, everything that comes out of our kitchen sink goes into a biodigester tank that's buried underneath the RV and then overflows into a hoogle culture which is just a pile of rotting wood and wood chips and branches and wood shavings. You're nodding because because we were making Google cultures in a, another place that's trying to become sustainable up in Wordsboro. Oh, nice. Yeah, so the two of us were working on that, yeah. And we're working. Mercy and USF working together. Yeah. Excellent. Because this, this has never been proposed before as a solution to the toilet waste problem, but when you're living it, when you're living off-grid and you have these, these constraints, you're either in an urban apartment or you're in a tiny RV with a tiny piece of land, you have to get really creative if you adopt this waste not, want not, there is no such thing as waste, and you have to own it. So we owned, my wife and I, that every time we went to the bathroom or took a shower, we had to own all that water, all that wastewater. And there's a law for septic tanks which says that effluent going in a leach field has to be at least two feet above the sand layer so there can be no groundwater contamination. And we thought, well, if we build a Google culture that is one and a half feet high, and have at least a half foot underneath where we have it loaded with branches and logs, then the idea was that the saturation of those logs and branches with the overlaid nutrients of the, uh, of the fecal material will then put it into aerobic contact with the decomposition process here. So you've actually got basically a compost bin, but it's an absorbent compost bin because it's based on piles of logs. That's what you know, a single yeah, culture. That's like, no, well, when I went and visited the site, and he showed me, I was like, yeah. It was like, it wasn't as high because it had been decomposing and right. it was rotting and started to melt, but it worked. It works tremendously, but yeah. nobody used toilet waste in years, did they? Yeah. No, so Hugo culture's been known by the Germans and the Austrians for decades and decades. It's a preferred way of putting nutrients in, and creating soil, basically, from deadfall. We just, with our students, came up with this idea that the tank could be a biodigester, so that replaces the, the septic tank. And then we get all the gas in the kitchen to cook on. But the overflow of any possible pathogens that weren't destroyed in the biodigester tank, which does kill 99%, 98% of all possible pathogens, could then go into an aerobic process that's living and create soil every day as the roots of the plants go in with their fungi, the mycelium, the hyphae, and they help to oxygenate it and introduce more biodiversity. And by golly, it really does work. And we think this is a landmark solution for replacing septic systems. And really, the problem with septic systems is one, the tank that you use isn't plumbed right so it doesn't increase biodiversity so that the pathogens can be destroyed. It's too cold, it's got plumbing where the air can get into the wrong stage in the process, it's, um, it doesn't have any mixing, and then it doesn't have enough surface area. Then when it comes out, you usually have gravel for your leach field that's buried too low where you can have some escape of pathogens down into the groundwater. And the gravel eventually gets biofilm clogged up and stops the movement and stops the aeration from coming and becomes itself septic. So we said, well, let's not use gravel. Also, every time people dig out their septic tanks uh, to clean them, they have to wash the gravel out, which costs a lot of money and labor, and then put it back in so the system will work again and the perforated pipe gets clogged. Our solution is logs and branches and they decay and become soil, as you know. And this is just sand over here. There is no fertility. So we're building soil all the time. There's no smell, there's no odor, and there's no possible pathogens. So we're really happy with this. And then, of course, we get this wonderful flame to cook on every day. And to have poop flame is fairly exciting. 